Hello and welcome to the Ideas Factory. I'm Nagma. With me is Professor Harsh Pant. In this episode of the Ideas Factory, we will try to look at all things significant that happened around the world and how does it impact the developments around the world. Uh, first of all, uh, we would like to look at the U.S. elections, uh, Professor Pant, and uh, it's probably about 100 days left for the U.S. elections and the comments that are coming from Donald Trump are uh, very confusing signals. He has said that he wants, in the present situation, he would like the US elections to be postponed. Uh, but at the same time, after some time, he went back. He is, the signals that he's giving is very, very confusing. And he's actually appearing like that student who's very nervous before the exam. Do you think he's panicking? Yes, I think that why, you know, in some ways, Mr. Trump is very transparent. His personality is very transparent. You understand that his emotions very, very clearly. And I think in this, in this case also, it's very clear that there is a sense of nervousness because I think things are unraveling around him in, in a way that perhaps, uh, you know, even in January, he was not predicting. Uh, the, the, you know, the, his, his mishandling of, of uh, administrative mishandling of the coronavirus, his confused approach to the whole pandemic, uh, his engagement uh, in the domestic politics, which is looking increasingly shambolic, uh, to to you know to use a phrase that is uh, you know uh, that might capture the the sense of what he's trying to do, and his I think the the internal turmoil in in America that seems to be uh, going away from his grasp as as a president. Uh, reveal a fundamental dysfunctionality not only within the American body politic but also in terms of how Mr. Trump has administered uh, the the U.S. Um, uh, elections uh, and so, so the uh, it's his presidency so far. So clearly, I think that the the pressure on him is quite palpable. The pressure on him is very significant. The poll numbers are going uh, in a direction that probably he was not anticipating, and and I think uh, in some ways. The, you know, the situation, it seems to me, is might be uh, beyond his control. He, he, he may not just, uh, you know, he, he, for him, it's at the moment, it's a do or die situation. He just doesn't know uh, how to handle it. And that is being reflected in the kind of statements he has made. So the two, you know, the, the statements about US elections that, uh, that he has said is, I think they're more aimed at confounding the electorate. Uh, the, the whole idea of casting aspersions on mail-in balloting system, where he seems to be suggesting that they would favor Democrats, and therefore, uh, for him, it is important to raise this, uh, you know, this banner or this red flag at this point, uh, so that uh, going forward, if there is a crisis, he can use this uh, to uh, to cast aspersions on the democratic process itself, in the in electoral process itself in the U.S. And that's a distinct possibility, as many American observers have pointed out. But I think at the moment, he's also, he has to tread a very, very fine line because he might be seen deemed as unconstitutional if he uh, is, keeps on making such statements. Clearly, he knows that postponing an elections is not something that executive can do. Only the Congress has the power to do it. And there he's not going to get the mandate. So he, yeah. he knows his limits, but he al he's also playing to the gallery. He's playing to his base. He's making sure that there are enough doubts about the system uh, in his base so that when he needs to rally them, rally the base behind him, He's, uh, you know, they, they are there and they are available and they can take the conversation in, in, a, in a direction that perhaps helps him out. So you're saying that he's trying to actually also confuse the electorate and uh, from what is coming out of the region, do you think he's been successful? You are also saying that he's actually preparing his vote bank to rally around him. But he's, he's actually launched a campaign against the Twitter trends, against the opinion polls. He's junking the opinion polls. He is basically bashing the Twitter trends. Uh, well, and like you said, it's also Trump versus the US Postal Service system. Uh, he's preparing the ground, basically, like you say. Yes, I think he's, he's preparing the ground for you know, for an eventual, uh, you know, uh, contest where he may lose and he might have to resort to various methods, which perhaps might prolong his, his stay in the office. Now, yeah. that's a very, very, you know, dicey move. That's a, that's a move that, call, that carries a lot of risks because if more and more people start seeing him uh, as, uh, as, an author as an extra constitutional authority, as someone who's trying to become an extra constitutional authority in, in, in the U.S. system, the backlash can be equally stronger. So I think, uh, you know, for him to raise a number of these points at a time when, uh, you know, when we also know that this is one of the most subdued elections in, a, in, in America's history, uh, recent history. 
Uh, and uh, even Mr. Biden, for you know, he seems to be uh, getting whatever poll uh, bounce he's getting. He seems to be getting because he's he's not Trump. It's not entirely clear that there is any uh, you know any enthusiasm for Mr. Biden. There is any support, uh, ground-based support for him. He's there because Mr. Trump is so disliked by others that they are wearing in favor of Mr. Biden. So clearly, I think for American body politics, this is a very, 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 very important moment because it may lead to a, a situation where the entire electoral process might be seen as, as, as one where, which has not delivered. And that, is, that can be a very dangerous thing in a democracy where, uh, where you know, electoral processes become uh, dysfunctional or are, are, are perceived to be dysfunctional. So like you say that whatever mileage Mr. Biden is getting is because he's not Trump. There is no special enthusiasm for him as well. And uh, what, what are the primary, we know that the primary causes right now have been his handling of the Corona pandemic and the US economy as a result has been in a very bad condition, worse than it, saw, uh, it ever was. Uh, and during this time, he's tried to bring in China, China as the focal point of the US election, it has been a big talking point, the US relation with China, the trade war, the, the protectionism and the feeling of, uh, you know, the emotion of nationalism against Huawei as well, 5G, all that, how, how is that playing out? Is that working? We've also seen that the Chinese diplomats all over have been very, very aggressive in furthering Mr. Xi's agenda. Yes, I think uh, you know uh, uh, this is this seems to be one of those elections where uh, in, in American elections where foreign policy in, in more ways than one is at the heart of it. You know, while I think in some ways Mr. Trump would be the defining factor, uh, and I think uh, Mr. Trump knows that if he becomes the central pivot around which this election revolves, then he has a very good chance of losing. So he is doing his very best to bring China into the center. So if, if, if the conversation, if the discussion, if the discourse becomes about China, then there is a distinct possibility that, that people will favor him. And we know that uh, Pew poll that has come out recently suggests yeah. a strong dislike for China among the American uh, people. They are increasingly looking at China as, a, as an adversary. They're looking at China as a problem. And I think the more Mr. Trump makes this election about China, the better his chances are, frankly, to be uh, to to uh, to get a bounce in his, in his poll numbers. And that's exactly what he's been trying to do. Make China the center of his conversations. So whether you look at coronavirus, e economy, whether you're looking at technology, 5G, all of that, that that you were talking about earlier, they point to this, uh, you know, this, this underpinning uh, of, uh, of sentiment in, in America about China. And they, they, are, they point to this uh, push from Mr. Trump to make China the central pivot. And then Mr. Biden is on a relatively weaker wicket because there are many who would, who would see uh, him and the, the, his generation of uh, politicians, especially in particular Democrats, uh, who, who would be weaker on national security, uh, who, would, who have not taken China's, China's bull by the horn, who are not, uh, you know, who, if they had acted in time, perhaps the results would have been different. So he can pivot the conversation. There is still time. So I think, therefore, he, for Mr. Trump, he wants China to be at the center so that he can keep rallying, uh, railing against Mr. Biden. And I think uh, that's perhaps, and he rightly sees that as his only chance to success because other things would take time. You know, coronavirus is not going anywhere in a hurry. Uh, economy is not going to revive in two months' time. Uh, the race relations are not going to become uh, suddenly uh, favorable to Mr. Trump. Uh, and his administrative competence is suddenly not going to grow uh, in, a, in a matter of weeks. So I think, therefore, China becomes such an important player in these elections. And as you point out, Chinese are uh, giving him uh, enough to enough rope to play with. You know, Chinese uh, ambassadors, Chinese diplomats, uh, they are everywhere. And they are, uh, you know, they, they, they seem to have taken Mr. Xi's, uh, um, uh, you know, role, uh, Mr. Xi's dictum to be at the vanguard of, of Chinese revival uh, at, at face value. And they're they are making, uh, you know, they're, they're going ahead in full steam, uh, not only in the US, but even in, even in India, we know, the spats that are going on between the Chinese ambassador and various other uh, yes. ambassadors. Absolutely. So we've seen a new a new kind of diplomacy, which is probably the Xi style of diplomacy or the Chinese style of diplomacy, where there is a special term now being used for the Chinese diplomats, the wolf warriors, and they're so actively engaged in the politics of the countries, the domestic politics. We've seen the spat between the Australian diplomat here um, and uh, the Barry O'Farrell on Twitter, on Twitter. So that's a new style of diplomacy. What would you call that, the Australian and the Chinese envoys uh, coming face to face? 
Yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's, it seems to be that uh, diplomacy itself has, uh, you know, become quite, uh, you know, uh, uh, has changed the character. It's, and, it's, and Chinese are changing it, you know, very, very rapidly. And, 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 yeah. and for others, it's a, it's a question of responding to that. Yeah. While, you know, you, you would think that diplomats like to do things differently behind closed doors uh, in, in a manner that is more subtle, uh, in a manner that is, you know, that sort of appreciates the fact that they represent a country uh, and not simply Chinese, you know, uh, you know the, the Chinese Communist Party, perhaps. But here in this case, we are looking at a scenario where, where, where you know, they have become uh, the sort of foot soldiers of Mr. Xi's uh, dream of Chinese revival. And in that, in that sense, they are, you know, they are talking about everything and they're so aggressive. And it seems to me that the whole purpose of diplomacy, if it is to resolve disputes, if it is to, if it is to become a bridge between two countries, two nations, two people, two civilizations, this is a very uh, negative way of approaching that the fundamental role that diplomats have tended to play. So we are looking at, uh, you know, at, at a diplomacy, perhaps that will change dramatically because what the Chinese are doing, others will have to respond. As you say, Australian ambassador had to respond to some of the things that were being said. Yes. And increasingly, it will be incumbent on other diplomats also who will, who will have to respond. Uh, I think, and, and the way the Chinese are in your face, the diplomats are in your face, uh, the fact that they are now, uh, you know, uh, they're not scared or afraid, frankly, of uh, being looked at uh, with a certain degree of derision or with a certain degree of, uh, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, you don't, uh, you don't want to be perceived negatively in another country. But that, has, that, you know, that is beyond the pale at the moment. Every, it seems that most Chinese diplomats don't want to be liked, uh, yeah. which, is, which is one of the things that initially all the diplomats wanted to be. You know, if you go to a different country, you wanted to be liked by the people of the, those countries because you represent uh, your own country. So I think the way the face that they are presenting to the rest of the world is increasingly a face which perhaps is what is with the Chinese Communist Party wants an, an, an aggressive, assertive China that will go to any extent to defend its interests and which cares to hoots about other countries. And I think that's the reality, perhaps, that we have to acknowledge and live with and also counter. And probably that will change the face of diplomacy as we now know diplomacy. There is no diplomacy left. There are, these are foot soldiers. They are here to further the, further the I mean, if I may say that Emperor Xi's uh, agenda here. And that's what they're doing. So anybody makes any comment about here in this case, we saw there was a comment about the South China Sea and how the uh, Chinese envoy uh, took it as his duty to defend uh, the entire thing. So we've seen that aggression, probably the others would have to react uh, simultaneously. But uh, we, so we see all these developments around us. And, and as a result, there are also pushbacks from other countries in various other ways. We see the Quad countries coming together. We see the Indian Ocean region and developments here. So we've just seen that Prime Minister Modi has virtually inaugurated the Supreme Court of Mauritius. And we, India and Mauritius um, are cooperating on various agendas. How do you see this, if you look at it in the bigger perspective of relations uh, amongst the Indian Ocean region countries? I think this, is, uh, this was important to do because uh, one of the problems that India has perennially faced in the region, uh, in, in Indian Ocean region or South Asian region, is this problem of uh, you know, over-promise and under-delivery. That you know, often you, you find India being... Uh, you know, uh, there is a complaint about India that, look, India just does not deliver. And therefore, Chinese fill that void. You know, Chinese are very quick on their feet. They come, uh, they, of course, they have more resources, but their ability to deliver is also very, very quick. And I think India increasingly is now gearing up to meet that challenge because we have seen a number of projects uh, being completed. Uh, and, and I think, therefore, what Prime Minister did to inaugurate the, the uh, Supreme Court uh, building in Mauritius, uh, was uh, underlines India's commitment to deliver on time. Even I think this was delivered before time yes. and uh, it was uh, below the cost that was initially um, uh, estimated. And so I think that the trend lines are quite clear that if India has to match China's profile or if, even if India has to maintain its own profile in the region, and that is, that is so vital uh, for India, Indian Ocean region after all is central to our strategic imagination. Mm -hmm. Then therefore with, with countries like Mauritius, Madag uh, you know, uh, uh, Mauritius, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, uh, India will have to step up to the plate and India will have to deliver uh, and it, on its commitments that it has made. Uh, so the old uh, you know, dictum of just, uh, you know, just declaring a pot of money uh, and then forgetting about it 
uh, doesn't really work in the in the contemporary context because there are other actors in, 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 that are playing the similar game and they will come in fill the void uh, make a play for it uh, go and and deliver if they deliver on time they become a more attractive option so i think uh, probably going forward this is the template that india india needs to follow and india is following and this this message that the prime minister was was giving uh, while inaugurating it virtually also suggested you know he suggested that how mauritius is important uh, critical for its indian ocean region indian ocean policy of india uh, and how it sits at the heart of india's sagar approach you know security mm. and growth uh, for all in the region this was something that prime minister uh, had enunciated in i think 2016 uh, in from mauritius during his visit to mauritius so clearly uh, for india for indian policy makers this is an important uh, you know um, uh, milestone this is an important moment and also recognition of uh, of the hard work that india will have to do uh, in going forward and i think uh, this is a good start and and hope uh, one hopes that this the process continues yes the thrust is in uh, on cooperation with countries in the indian ocean region and uh, if we look at how the other countries are reacting to china's aggression european union is a very important block that we have to see also in terms of the Uh, you know the technology the trade war that's going on uh, the reactions as far as 5g huawei is concerned so we've seen a push back there uh, from couple couple of countries and germany still is in a dilemma of uh, how, what to do and how to maneuver this but we've heard we've had a comment from eu's joseph uh, borrell who has called for a more united approach from all the 27 member countries uh, right now as far as huawei is concerned we've seen slightly different approach varying varied approach but a call for a more united approach shows that eu is seriously thinking of how to deal with a more aggressive china though china is very important for many countries as a trading partner it overtook united states in 2016 as far as germany's trading uh, trade with germany is concerned yes i think we know what we were discussing earlier about this wolf warrior diplomacy and how aggressive chinese diplomacy has been and one of the things it has done is is that it has made it absolutely clear to those who even a year before were you know assumed that somehow china would change somehow uh, you know china would become uh, more accommodating of other countries interests and i think that's what borrell also pointed out very very categorically in this very very interesting interview that he gave to the spiegel uh, german newspaper where i think uh, you know the idea is that look we have uh, where he seems to be suggesting that european union had tried its best to engage with china we have uh, you know in, in some ways uh, tried to uh, move as far as we could uh, he was suggesting but there there has been no reciprocal uh, uh, you know, uh, there has been no reciprocity from china and that meant uh, that means that uh, you you will have to fundamentally reassess whether it can work with china or not so he made this very important uh, you know call again which is a, which is i think a larger meta narrative emerging uh, across the world about democracies and how democracies will have to come together and work because yes, ultimately yes. there is no other way of managing china's rise china which is presenting an alternative almost an alternative world order so he uh, i think was also expressing his disappointment that you pointed out of a you know of sort of uh, a disunited european union Uh, you know, where member mm-hmm. countries are taking very distinct positions uh, or at least are reluctant to explicitly state their positions for example if you look at france on huawei uh, france has effectively banned it they have been more subtle about it but they have effectively told uh, their vendors not to use huawei uh, germany uh, whereas you have uh, you know deutsche telekom for example that is that has been reducing its dependence on on huawei but there has been no explicit statement by germany germany is still reluctant to make uh, an open case against china and i think that was he was uh, he was talking to a german newspaper he was also alluding to that fact that look we have to come to terms with this new reality and we have to come to terms with our own inability to shape it and so i think this is this is this was a very important intervention because it shows how far european union has like come like a message you would say that it was a message to german chancellor merkel who probably <laughs> I, I, said I, i would think so yes i think yeah. uh, he was in a sense saying that uh, to his own interlocutors within Uh, european union that we need to, to get our act together in particular germany because unless germany decides uh, to take a strong position uh, other countries would be very reluctant to do the same and german germany is in a sense along with france the de facto leader of this of this group and germany has been very very reluctant so i think we are looking at a, a rapidly changing uh, way of thinking uh, in in european union in brussels 
Uh, and I think the, the issue that he has raised uh, about other countries, like-minded countries, in which he included India, will be very important to watch out for because India has always complained about this geopolitical ambiguity from European Union. Now, as European Union becomes, uh, clarifies its position, becomes more explicit, uh, it would be incumbent upon India also to reciprocate. So I think it would be interesting to see how India and EU then decide to move, move together in shaping a larger framework where they can respond to the China challenge, uh, given their past differences. But I think the European Union's uh, internal discourse is moving in a direction that over the long term, uh, by and large, should be beneficial to India. Absolutely. So India has to see uh, where it can place itself in this new scenario and uh, how can it uh, actually utilize this moment where you see a pushback. The China challenge is looming large and the different countries uh, are actually urging uh, each other to stand together against China. So that's, that's it uh, on this episode of Ideas Factory for this week and we'll see you all next week. Thank you so much.